Professor Walter Oberly is a lecturer, senior lecturer in Durham University, and for years he was trying to do something between, I don't think we do enough in the Euro Republic, because he's trying to connect uh, exegesis with theology. I remember my doctoral defense here, and one of the last question was, does it teach anything for theology? And I said, I never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thank you for coming here and opening our eyes uh, and sensitivity. Uh, not only about, so it will be just about some ancient ideas that somebody could have in the past of God, but actually to say something. About God Himself, it is, it is a, it is a challenge, and, and thank you for for that. Um, the most recent book, Walter Morley published last year, is entitled "The Bible in Disenchanted Age," and it deals exactly with this the theme of uh, a biblical authority and interpretation. So you shifted towards having more hermeneutical questions also um, interesting interesting for us and for us, as far as I know you prepare uh, has been lectures for, for Cambridge that we will have them this year yes. after, after some. so thank you and we're here to listen to you thank you thank you for your welcome uh, to be invited to the Ecole Biblique to deliver a Lagrange lecture is an honour. Thank you. I must apologise for my linguistic limitations, which means I'm an Englishman who speaks English, whether at home or abroad. I wish it were otherwise. I feel slightly bad that it isn't, but so it is. So I hope my English will nonetheless uh, be accessible. Um, I hope you will all have a handout. Um, the handout has a copy of the Hebrew text of Psalm 82 that we'll be looking at, and also a translation, the New Jewish Publication Society version. Um, and it has, it has also, okay, um, it has the main headings which I will be speaking to, so I hope it will be of some assistance, especially should you start to think the thought, how long, O oh Lord, um, you will know when the expected end um, is in sight in terms of how far down the sheet we've got. In the American TV spy thriller, Homeland, in the sixth season, the third episode, and beginning in the 42nd minute, senior CIA operative Saul Berenson visits his sister Dorit, who lives in the West Bank in a Jewish settlement built directly opposite a Palestinian village. There are some preliminary exchanges about their families. Dorit has children and grandchildren. Saul had a childless marriage that has failed. The conversation turns to how Saul and Dorit have drifted apart despite their childhood closeness. Both recognize that the drift began when Dorit married Moshe, who was an ardent Zionist. Saul laments that Moshe was an unbending fanatic, while Dorit says that Moshe opened my eyes, made me proud to be a Jew. The conversation between Saul and Dorit develops. Saul, he turned you against your family. He brought you to live in a place that's not yours, where you don't belong. Haven't you driven enough people from their homes already, bulldozed their villages, seized their property under laws they had no part in making? Dorit, this land was promised to Avraham. Saul, so, ah yes, promise, covenant with God made thousands of years ago. 
Doesn't that strike you as a form of insanity? Dorit, you don't understand, Saul. I love the life that God has given me. How can you love making enemies? How can you love knowing that your very presence here makes peace less possible? I have a family, a community, a life filled with faith and purpose. Saul, what do you have? Dorit turns and walks away while the camera lingers on Saul sitting in silence. My interest here is not in the rights and wrongs of Zionism, which is an extremely complex phenomenon. Rather, I'm interested in the differing outlooks that characterize Saul and Dorit. Dorit appeals to the Bible, talks about what God has promised in the past and is doing today, and speaks of the difference that faith makes to her life concerns to which Saul seems impervious. Saul, however, is concerned for justice and peace for the Palestinians, a concern to which Dorit seems impervious. And Saul directs his strongest language against the idea that something attributed to God in the Bible could still be valid for socio-political realities today. Their views are not only starkly polarised, but communication between them in this whole area seems impossible. They just talk past each other in a way that seems all too characteristic of our contemporary world. I would like to leave this picture of Saul and Dorit with its antithesis between God and the Bible and piety on one hand and the priorities of justice and an attitude of religious scepticism on the other, hovering somewhere in the background of the discussion that follows. But quite apart from the problematic dynamics of uh, the exchange between Saul and Dorit, many ordinary believers, both Jewish and Christian, can struggle to know how to understand and express the content of the Bible, not just through time-honoured wording and familiar liturgical formulations, but in ways that genuinely engage the realities of the contemporary world. One prime challenge for the scholar is to find fresh conceptualities and interpretative practices that can perhaps begin to do justice to the content of the Bible in relation to the needs and hopes of today. As a modest contribution towards this wider task, I would like to offer a fresh reading of Psalm 82. Psalm 82 is one of the most intriguing and challenging of Psalms. Its date and content of context of origin is elusive. Scholars usually date the psalm by locating its content at a seemingly appropriate stage within their overall conception of the nature and development of Israelite religion. Responsible scholars have, however, ascribed the psalm variously to just about all periods from the pre-monarchic period to the Maccabean period. When dates ranging over a full thousand years have been seriously proposed, the only safe inference is that we simply do not know when the psalm was written other than that it originates at some point in the life of ancient Israel. Such ignorance may or may not matter, however, it all depends on the purpose for which one is reading. The song's genre is distinctive. Strikingly, apart from the first and last verses, God is not the addressee, but apparently the speaker. The question of who's speaking at any point in the psalm is contested, but I go with a consensus view that for much of the psalm it looks to be God is the speaking voice. 
The psalm has been described as, for example, a didactic psalm, a prophetic oracle, a scribal prophecy, part of a temple liturgy, even specifically a New Year liturgy. But such attempts to articulate genre via a historically imaginative construal of the possible nature and purpose of its content essentially serves to show that this psalm fits none of the recognized categories of psalm genre. It is genuinely sui generis. How best then might it be interpreted? In modern scholarship, the psalm is regularly cited as a rare example of full-blown myth in the Old Testament and as significant evidence for the indebtedness of Israel's religion to Canaanite influence, specifically the original rootedness of Israel's religion in polytheism. Plural terms for deity are used, and a plurality of deities is envisaged. As John Levinson succinctly puts it, quote, It is by no means certain that the God Elohim, who takes his stand, is the same as the God El, in whose assembly he speaks, verse 1. Nor is it at all clear that these two are identical to the Most High, Elyon, whom verse 6 identifies as the Father of the Gods. In fact, the context is redolent of the polytheism that we see in a scene from a Canaanite poem from not later than about 1400 BCE, when mighty Baal takes his stand in the divine assembly and spits in defiance. End quote. The psalm is also generally seen as marking a significant step in the development of Israel's religious thought though this can be variously envisaged. There are, I think, two main and closely related options in the literature. First, one can see a particular Israelite version of a common ancient understanding that different peoples had their own distinct tutelary deities. Scholars regularly associate Psalm 82 with Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 8 and 9, which apparently envisages the Lord being responsible solely for Jacob Israel in the way that other deities were responsible for other nations. It is common to find in Psalm 82 a modification or abrogation of Deuteronomy's scenario. Secondly, one can see a religious development which is a transition in some way from many gods to one, a move that would appear to be a natural corollary of the rejection of the notion of tutelary deities. These options can be variously expressed. John Levinson, for example, succinctly says, Psalm 82 thus opens in polytheism and closes in monotheism. Alternatively, Mark Smith eschews monotheism in this context and draws more explicitly on the conceptuality of Deuteronomy 32 verses 8 and 9 as key to interpretation. Quote, Psalm 82 preserves a tradition that casts the God of Israel not in the role of the presiding God of the Pantheon, but as one of his sons. Each of these sons has a different nation as his ancient patrimony or family inheritance, and therefore serves as its ruler. Then verse 8 calls on Yahweh to arrogate to himself the traditional inheritance of all the other gods, all the nations. Such a construal has conceptual similarity to the rise of Marduk to supremacy over his fellow deities in Enuma Elish, a certain kind of battle of the gods, albeit in a highly distinctive mode. One might perhaps summarize the difference between these construals as one instead of many or one over many. 
Or, in convenient but questionable modern categories, it's a matter of monotheism or henotheism. Either way, perhaps the most interesting thing for the historian of religion is that the biblical text preserves the outlines of the older religious outlook that it is rejecting and seeking to replace. The older outlook was preserved because it was amenable to reinterpretation. El and Elion can become terms for the Lord. Other deities can be reconceived as angelic beings. But the historian of religion penetrates behind the reinterpretation to the putative antecedent and likely original form of thought, which was polytheistic. They thereby achieve a richer and more differentiated understanding of the development of Israelite religion in its ancient context. So I take something like that to be, you know, what you find in most of the commentaries and studies that are out there, you know, with variations. So, how might we read the psalm freshly? Three preliminary issues can frame the task. First, the classic reading of this psalm among both Christians and Jews for most of the last 2,000 years is that it's not about an assembly of ancient deities at all. Rather, it is a reminder to human judges that they are accountable to God and also an admonition to them genuinely to practice justice. Such a reading makes good sense. It's based on the traditional Jewish understanding that the term Elohim could sometimes refer to certain exalted humans, judges and kings, who are often the same person, because one of the main tasks of the ancient king was to uh, administer justice. This was based on a few specific texts where it was apparently thought that Elohim actually meant judges. This classic Jewish construal was still apparently considered well established in the early 20th century, as it is to be found in the standard Browned Driver and Briggs lexicon, look under Elohim, the first entry is Elohim as judges. But in the course of the 20th century, both semantic and comparative religio-historical considerations showed that to understand Elohim as judge is implausible. Deity is the sense of Elohim, even if occasionally the term might idiomatically be used with a human referent for honorific reasons in contexts of poetic panegyric. Psalm 45.7 is the, the famous example. To be sure, this traditional construal of Elohim as judges still persists among some traditionally minded commentators. You can find recent commentaries on the shelf with that reading. Nonetheless, the meaning of Elohim in Psalm 82 can stand as, I think, a good example of how traditional ecclesial and theological understandings may need to be modified in the light of modern philology and the rediscovery of the world of the ancient Near East from which the Old Testament arose. The second issue follows on. If human judges recede and an assembly of ancient Near Eastern deities takes their place, how, if at all, is this scenario to be meaningful for contemporary thought and practice? As uh, the American scholar Patrick Miller puts it, with reference to the concerns of Christian preaching, quote, Psalm 82 is so thoroughly a mythopoeic text, assuming the world of the gods as an operative image, that it is very difficult to translate the, claim, the claims of the psalm into the language of proclamation. The setting is intimately what it is about. It resists demythologization. A sermon about the assembly of the gods may be possible, 
but there are inherent obstacles to it as the subject of preaching. You know, one doesn't imagine the average congregation will, you know, sort of thrill to the, to the theme. A third issue again follows on. Is it possible to retain the significance of the poem precisely as a poem? The making of a possibly substantive point about divine justice, which is what often happens, may easily become more or less independent of the specific imagery of the psalm and the movement within it. So there's a further challenge to hold together in one way or other form and content, the medium and the message. One initial observation is that a Christian theologian, as I like to think of myself, I, I, at least on a good day, um, is likely often to make conceptual moves in a different direction from those of the historian of religion. That is, a theologian may be inclined to go with the flow of the text and its interpretative tradition and see what existential and conceptual possibilities are opened up by the mature understandings represented in Israel's canonical texts, rather than to go against the flow so as to recover possible earlier understandings about polytheism that may have been deliberately displaced. Of course, the theologian should still learn from the historian of religion and approach the text with greater historical and conceptual nuance as a result. More specifically, the springboard for my reading is the observation of two silences or absences in the text of Psalm 82. So we're actually starting to get to the biblical text. The first is the lack of any language for, or apparent interest in, one and many in relation to the divine realm. There is no use of echad, one, or brabim, many, or equivalents. For of course, the Old Testament's regular idiomatic epithet for deities other than the Lord is not rabim, many, but acherim, other. Rather, the psalm's consistent interest throughout is in the matter of justice in relation to the divine realm. Not the number of the gods, but the moral content of their practice is the psalm's concern. The second absence is the name of Israel's deity, the Lord. Adonai Hashem. For the history of religious thought accounts that I've outlined, the Lord becoming either sole deity or supreme deity, this is prima facie a puzzling problem. The divine name ought to be the psalm's first word after the heading, as the logic of the psalm, when read in these terms, surely requires it. The Lord takes a stand. Rather than the actual wording of the text, God, Elohim, takes a stand. However, the puzzle has a solution ready at hand. This is the argument that an original proper name, Adonai, has been changed into the generic term for deity, Elohim, by an editor. This supposition is not simply a matter of appealing to the internal logic of the psalm in its supposed religio-historical context, but is based also on the location of Psalm 82 within the so-called Elohistic Psalter, which is Psalms 42 to 83. Here, Contrary to predominant usage elsewhere in the Psalter, Elohim is preferred to Adonai, and there is reason to suppose that at least sometimes Elohim may have displaced an original Adonai, 
though I think you can usually argue it both ways. The critical judgment that an original Adonai has been replaced by Elohim in verse 1 is, as far as I can see, considered secure and uncontroversial. So much so that Krauss, in his major commentary, actually inserts the tetragram into his translation of the text in both verse 1 and verse 8. And this could, of course, be right. Nonetheless, I wish to take seriously the fact that the generic term for deity, rather than the proper name of Israel's deity, stands in the text. No doubt this may be in part because of my general preference to work with the received text that we actually have, rather than a putative and no longer extant original. But there is warrant also in the fact that the Old Testament sometimes uses the generic Elohim in preference to the Israel-specific Adonai for conceptual reasons. Usually, this is because of a desire, of a desire to indicate that non-Israelites may have, or at least ought to have, some genuine knowledge of the one God, even while the writers recognize that this knowledge is not conceived in terms of a knowledge of God as Adonai. In Genesis 1, for example, the use of the generic Elohim seems to be related to a depiction of the whole world as the creation of the one God. In this depiction, the focus is consistently on the world as a whole, and the people of Israel and their location in the world are not mentioned nor given any privilege. My proposal, therefore, a thought experiment perhaps, if you like, is to read the Elohim of Psalm 82, particularly verse 1a, its opening, as intrinsically meaningful, as indicative of the psalm, as an exercise in explicating the meaning of the term Elohim. Or, in other words, to put it in unashamedly contemporary categories, I suggest that the psalm can be well read as a conceptual analysis of what is and is not meant by the term Elohim. This analysis, however, is conveyed in imaginatively concrete form rather than a theoretical or abstract mode for the imaginatively concrete form is the generally preferred way of doing theology among the biblical writers. So, a reading of Psalm 82, and you'll be pleased to know it's already the, the final section on the handout, <coughs> though it will take a little time. The psalmist's imaginative scenario unfolds in several parts. Verse 1, God stands in the divine assembly, among the divine beings he pronounces judgment. First, the poet envisages a divine assembly in, one, in which one particular deity, Elohim, takes a stand among other deities, Elohim. This assembly is imagined by analogy with any typical human assembly, where people gather and someone takes a stand and speaks. In this case, however, those present are divine rather than human. The relationship between the Elohim who takes a stand and the other Elohim is not specified. However, the Elohim in the second part of verse 1 are plural, as one can stand in their midst, while the deity who takes a stand is singular, as indicated by the form of the verb to take a stand, nitzav. The deity taking a stand is thus implicitly the deity of Israel, the Lord. 
in line with the regular, though not invariable, but it is the regular and dominant idiom of the Hebrew scriptures, that the Lord is depicted by singular verbs and adjectives, while other deities, Elohim Acherim, are depicted with plural verbs and adjectives. If the poet is able to depict what happens in this divine assembly, then he himself must implicitly in some way be present, and thus able to describe what he sees and hears. In other words, the poet is imagining himself as Moses or one of the prophets. In Deuteronomy 5's memorable portrayal, Moses was given the weighty responsibility to draw so near to the Lord that he could hear the Lord's words and thereby instruct Israel as the paradigmatic Navi prophet. The point is a proximity to the Lord sufficient to enable the knowing of the Lord's will. Imaginatively depicted in terms of overhearing the pronouncements of a divine king to his courtiers gathered in council. When the poet writes what he sees and hears, and it is preserved and made available to others, then we too, as subsequent readers or hearers, are given access to this weighty scenario. Put differently, the implications of the literary genre are crucial for a right reading. Why does a poet portray a heavenly scenario? If one thinks for a moment of contemporary analogies, either accounts of conversations with St. Peter at the Pearly Gates, or wry accounts of the surprising discoveries that certain believers make when they actually start to go around in the heavenly domain and find who's there, the point is clear. Heavenly scenarios refract and impact upon mundane earthly realities. The situation up there is told to make a difference to what people think and do down here. What God says about the gods in this setting is spoken aloud for the benefit of those whom the poet enables to hear what is said. That is, everything is for the benefit of the reader or hearer who is located in the context of everyday life. Verses 2 to 4. How long will you judge perversely, showing favour to the wicked? Judge the wretched and the orphan. Vindicate the lowly and the poor. Rescue the wretched and the needy. Save them from the hand of the wicked. In this second part of the poem, although there's no speech introduction such as, and God said, it seems contextually clear that these are the words of the God who has taken a stand to pronounce judgment, words addressed to the other deities present. Initially, there's a rhetorical question that makes clear that the issue at hand is one of injustice and corruption, that's two. This is then followed by four imperatives paired which prescribe behaviour that is the opposite of injustice and corruption. The first pair of imperatives relate specifically to what those in positions of power in a court of law should do. Judge. Vindicate. The second pair of imperatives, while still applicable to practices in a law court, could readily refer also to actions in problematic situations of oppression or danger in life generally. Rescue. Deliver. The recipients of these actions are those who are poor and vulnerable, those whose life situation is diminished, as expressed by the repeated key word, wretched. 
passage is thus a prime expression of the characteristic Old Testament understanding of justice. The critical test of justice is its practice in contexts not only where there is great human need, but also where there is little or no social or financial benefit for the judge. For if justice is practiced here, it will also most readily be practiced elsewhere also. In a different idiom, this can be seen as an Old Testament formulation of a preferential option for the poor. Verse 5. They neither know nor understand. They go about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth totter. This verse is initially difficult, as it is unclear who the they are and who is the speaking voice. I propose that the imagined scene is momentarily shifting away from the divine assembly, implicitly located in a celestial realm, to a brief glimpse of life on earth. This brief vision could conceivably be a redescription of the deities who are gathered in assembly, to show that their reality is that they ignorantly blunder in darkness. Yet, since the next two verses of the psalm move on precisely to a redescription of the deities and their reality, I suggest that a redescription here would be premature. Rather, the picture of incomprehension, bleakness, and life on earth being utterly unstable well depicts the existential situation of the poor and vulnerable when justice is denied them. As such, God could still be the speaker, though equally, and I think to my mind preferably, this could be the voice of the poet interposing. Either way, we briefly see something of the dire consequences when corruption displaces justice. Verses 6 and 7. I had taken you for divine beings, sons of the Most High, all of you, but you shall die as men do, fall like any prince. Remarkably, here we have a kind of Götterdämmerung, a twilight of the gods. But it's an unusual vision. The notion of one God defeating, showing superiority over, or even killing other gods is common enough in ancient religions. But the notion that one deity should deny divine status to other supposed deities would appear to be unprecedented. Moreover, the precise tenor of these striking words is easily missed. Some translations, apparently unduly swayed by the judicial scenario in the poem as a whole, find here that God is pronouncing a verdict on the other gods. So we read translations like, this is my sentence, gods you may be, yet you shall die. That's the New English Bible. Or, I hereby declare you are gods, but you will die. Yet the meaning of the words is not this, for they utilize a specific and not uncommon Hebrew idiom. The use of ani amarti, I said or thought or had taken you for, followed by achen, but in fact. This idiom expresses an initial faulty understanding of something that appeared to be the case, but is subsequently corrected by a better and more accurate realization. For example, uh, Isaiah 49.4, the Isianic servant at one point supposed 
va'ani amarti, that he had laboured in vain, but then realises that in fact, ahen, his rightness and the value of his cause is secure in God's hands. Or Psalm 31, 23, the psalmist's initial supposition, va'ani amarti, that he was removed from God's sight, is corrected by the realization that in fact, Achen, the Lord has heard his prayer. Not a judicial verdict, but the correction of a faulty supposition about something initially plausible is the concern of the idiom of the text, Ani Amarti Achen. The faulty supposition in Psalm 82 concerns the generic nature of those gathered in the assembly, that they were Elohim, deities. They are not, because of their injustice, for which they will die as humans die. Who are these other members of the divine assembly? Interestingly, we're not told. The silence about their identities probably means it's not significant. One could easily imagine the poet lining up deities from Israel's neighbours, say Dagon, Chemosh, Baal, to make a polemical point about their demotional demise. This is not done. The presentation is generalised and anonymous. Why then should it have been supposed that these other members of the divine assembly were Elohim in the first place? It is not straightforward to find good conceptual categories here, mainly because of a modern tendency to see issues of metaphysics and ontology as integral to discussions about the possible reality or unreality of God and gods. I would suggest that the reason is essentially phenomenological and pragmatic. In other words, there simply were many Elohim in Israel's world. Deities to whom people looked in prayer and hope, deities whose cult was observed in a way that gave identity and order to their worshippers, deities who were expected to give their people victory over their enemies. To avoid misunderstanding, this is not a claim about metaphysical ontology, when I say that there were deities, but about the way life was lived and experienced. If this was Israel's world, and Israel with its God existed in their midst, then it was meaningful for an Israelite poet to project this world imaginatively into the heavenly realm and envisage these deities as constituting a divine assembly among whom Israel's God was also present. What then follows from God being the, deter being the determinative figure in this assembly and recognizing that these others who are supposed to be deities are not really so? On the one hand, going back to the question of literary genre, it surely displays a distinctly wooden handling of the text to worry about possible implicit limitations within God and ask a question such as, and this is taken from one of the standard commentaries, is it likely that Yahweh would have been fooled in his judgment about the true nature of the gods you know, so before he came to the realization? All sorts of things are dramatically possible in an enacted scenario that's making a point. In dramatic terms, what matters is what the onlookers or listeners need to know. In this instance, what they need to know about what they have taken to be gods. On the other hand, in conceptual terms, if the other deities were present in the divine assembly in the first place, 
then the assumption was that they would be responsible rulers concerned with the practice of justice. The appropriate inference from their corruption and failure to practice justice is that they were not really deities at all. They may have appeared to be so for many possible reasons, yet the critical test that shows that the apparent divinity is only apparent and not real is their lack of moral integrity, as evidenced by their insufficient concern for justice. The correlative logic of the scene is that the Elohim who pronounces this about the others is thereby appropriately understood as a God of justice and integrity, not incidentally, but definitionally, constitutively. This Elohim would not be God unless justice and integrity were essential to his nature. The poem is thus, in its own way, and this is my argument, a conceptual analysis of the nature of deity. How then might such a poem appropriately be used? An initial answer is present within the psalm itself, in the words that conclude it. Verse 8. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your possession. The realisation that justice is constitutive of true deity is in the first instance an insight neither for intellectual satisfaction, it is good to understand the nature of reality, nor for intellectual puzzlement. If the true God is just, why does the world have so much injustice? even if both of these responses have their place. Rather, it's an understanding that requires active engagement with this deity in the form of prayer. In a way that is characteristic of the biblical literature more generally, theological understanding is not only intellectual, but also existential and participatory, and the reality of which it speaks is not just a given, but a goal, something to be entered into and appropriated. And there's lots of details at every point that I'm passing over just to, to get through um, the presentation as a whole. Um, but I come now to some uh, concluding reflections. In my reading of Psalm 82, I'm suggesting that the psalmist paints an imaginative picture so as to offer a conceptual analysis of deity in terms of the practice of justice. The deity who is God is the deity for whom justice is intrinsic. The gods who are dismissed as not really gods and are doomed to die are those whose lack of intrinsic justice shows that they are not really divine in the way they were initially supposed to be. This is not to deny that ancient peoples other than Israel also associated their deities with the practice of justice. Lots of evidence for that. The key issue that Psalm 82 poses is whether justice is constitutive of true deity. This brings with it a corollary issue of how humans might be expected to recognize true deity when they encounter it. On the reading I'm offering, the psalm offers a criterion for critical discernment. Insofar as that which people worship is intrinsically related to the realization of justice on earth, then that can be affirmed as a discernment of true deity. 
it also becomes possible to entertain the thought that wherever on earth there is justice, there in some way God is present. Ubi justitia Deus ibi est. God's justice represents a reality into which all humans need to enter. This understanding of God, however, must not be taken in isolation. That is, the biblical witness associates numerous qualities other than justice as also intrinsic to the deity who is God. Psalm 82 is one voice among many others, a faith which is rooted in the canonical collection as a whole is committed to a synthetic construal of many biblical voices as witnesses to the mysterious reality which is God. Even to hold together solely the two qualities of justice and mercy in relation to God as well as among humans is demanding both in thought and practice. Moreover, the question of what counts as justice is often difficult to discern in practice and changes over time. For example, what constitutes justice in a culture that has experienced the emancipation of women in its laws and social reality will differ from what would have counted as justice in earlier cultures where social roles and responsibilities were differently understood. Alternatively, if we revisit the standoff between Saul and Dorit, with which this discussion opened, we can see that Dorit's perspective associates God with family and communal life, but not with issues of justice. This surely reflects that demoralizing of God and marginalization of God away from the public sphere and the common good that has been so characteristic of post-Enlightenment Western modernity. Some theologians, of course, not least those associated with liberation theology, but not solely those, have protested at uh, some of these moves. To say all this does not, of course, resolve the challenges posed by the modern state of Israel and its settlements in relation to the concerns of the Palestinians, but perhaps that means at heart that the challenges of living justly are never finally resolved, but must always be confronted afresh as life goes on. Or in other words, the prayer of Psalm 82 verse 8 still needs to be prayed. To conclude, I return briefly to two difficulties noted earlier. Is the picture of an assembly of ancient deities imaginatively too remote from the world of the 21st century? And how can one hold together the medium of the poem with the message that one may want to take from it? The problem of imaginative remoteness is real, but can easily, I think, be overstated. We live in a culture where many have no difficulty whatever in taking with full imaginative seriousness scenarios that are far removed from our everyday world. These may be set a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, cue Star Wars theme, or else they may envisage superhuman heroes, both ancient and modern, from Thor to Captain America, who get together as a team of the Avengers to save the modern world. The issue is not, I think, that people lack imaginative flexibility in general, but rather that they often struggle to exercise it in the particular context of biblical interpretation where a certain kind of woodenness all too readily sets in. Preoccupation with questions such as, is it literally true, or, but did it actually happen like that, or how could God really have been ignorant of something, too easily displace proper literary awareness. 
ability to read diverse literary genres with full imaginative seriousness, to enter into the world of the text, and to see a variety of metaphorical and analogical ways of engaging with textual content is surely a necessary dimension of biblical literacy. Finally, you will be pleased to hear my last paragraph. I suggested that the psalm's approach to other deities is essentially phenomenological and pragmatic that there simply were many Elohim in Israel's world. I would suggest that the same is true in the world of the 21st century. By this, I do not mean that people today generally hold religious outlooks characteristic of the ancient world. That is clearly not the case. Rather, I have in mind the long-standing tradition, which has strong biblical roots, that a primary meaning of the term God is that upon which people fundamentally set their hearts and towards which they orient their priorities. In this sense, Although many people today may see no use for the little three-letter word G-O-D, other than in exclamations, where it has plenty of use, this does not preclude recognition of their treating people, things, and ideas as gods. The question of whether those realities which people treat as gods are appropriately treated as such is an enduring issue of life that does not go away. One of the most characteristic affirmations of those who come to faith in God in the context of a continuing tradition of thought and life rooted in the Bible is that certain things that they had previously reckoned to matter most do not, in reality, have that importance. Thank you. I had an advantage of having this text before you, <laughs> so I can, could prepare uh, my, uh, my answer, my reactions uh, for like two weeks. And I think good article, good text is something that makes you think, and you made me think, and I thank you for that. I would like to share with you my, my thoughts. First point concerns hermeneutics, and two following are more theological. First uh, is, uh, was, was the, the thing I would call serious fiction. Serious fiction. Uh, if you imagine the scene, uh, could Elohim stand up, please, around? This is more or less what you propose for this mm-hmm. psalm. Uh, uh, sounds funny, but uh, I think in modern world we have a too rigid and I would say actually primitive distinction between fiction and history in which, uh, first of all, the distinction is not so clear at all. And secondly, when we deal with fiction as something dissociated from the truth, and it's evidently not the case. Um, That's why uh, some modern minds uh, made people to underestimate the paradise narrative, first chapter of the book of Genesis, because they couldn't find talking serpents. Or they taught that book of Jonah is just a simple booklet for simple tomes, because actually you couldn't find big fish enough for the person who have it. So they damned all this story in not considering it as a serious literature. Uh, and this war is still pushes people to for quest of Noah's Ark and, and all 
other objects that should prove the truth, the truth of, of, of the Bible, scriptural veracity. This is, of course, yeah, primitive modern mind. I just give you a famous quote from Aristotle who in, in, in Poetics, and he said this famous phrase, poiesi, so poetry and what we produce is more philosophical and more serious than history. In fact, poetry speaks more of universals, whereas history of particulars. This is a classic perspective on, on, on poetry. So the authors, as well as the readers, knew that there is, there always was, a difference between the genre of uh, uh, serious fiction and a Milesian tale created just for, for the sake of amusement. Uh, if you th think about New Testament, actually most of Jesus' parables is actually that. It's serious fiction. So something, uh, fiction with serious intent, something that uh, n intends to engage the reader uh, with all um, existential and intellectual seriousness. Uh, the second point is, uh, is theological, dealing more. I, my theology, I'm Thomistic, more so I need to have <laughs> classical divisions. I would call it the Deo Uno. I don't know how much your conscience, maybe you are, that you enter the deep division that exists in theology between, um, uh, between the position which we call um, uh, voluntarist and intellectualist vision of, of God. It starts with philosophers, as usual, because theology needs philosophy to exist. Um, this is most uh, famously expressed by Plato in his dialogue, uh, Eutifro, Eutifro, I suppose you say it in English, when Socrates uh, asks this famous question, is that which is holy loved by the gods because it is holy, or is it holy because it is loved by the gods? So causality, uh, who's first? Is uh, something good because wanted is it to be good or the other way around? Um, and this division, this question is not only proper for Christianity, of course, it exists also in Islam. Um, uh, we call it uh, the, the, the proposition in, in position which we promote rather the vision that whatever God commands is just and it is just beast simply because God wanted it. We call it the divine command theory. Um, and uh, in, you have a number of scholars, famous theologians who more or less follow that line like Augustine of course and number of classic Islamic scholars, Dun Scotus, William of, uh, of Ockham, Luther and Calvin of your tradition. Um, and in that extreme position for Ockham, we would say it doesn't matter if God became a human on a donkey, it doesn't matter really, he could do whatever he wanted. And actually we could get a totally different list of commandments because it's just God's ideas that he decided that it is good. It has nothing to do with objective. Um, value. Well, you can feel that there is some dangers of that position because then human ethics have no value actually. And secondly, the distinction between a god and, uh, and a demon is just a matter of, you know, whatever. It disappears as well. The opposite uh, uh, position, which is uh, theologic intell intellectualism, which is more Dominican, so I'm glad you joined our, our group. Uh, through your article. I don't know if you agree with that. Um, in that position, uh, of course, God, uh, it's God's nature. He, God has to be what he, what he is and nothing else. Um, let us, uh, maybe it's a matter of question also, in that a statement, so uh, a God, Elohim recognizes that the others, they are not gods. I can see something of almost um, law, something that he doesn't need to do anything. He's not proclaimed, just sit and wait, they will collapse, they will die. 
is some, something very similar to this worldview we have in wisdom literature, something what was called, was called in, in the scholarship, uh, to, again, Zusammenhang, so a mechanism that simply works, that, you know, the one who kills is killed, the, this one who steals will lose his property, and so, and so on. <coughs> and then, um, uh, second theological point is a certain theological anthropology which can we recover from this, uh, from this reading of yours. We learn uh, from Psalm 82 that Elohim must necessarily perform justice and follow what is just. One could worry, and maybe rightly so, that if this is to be applied generally, then we're imposing human categories as you say, justice, which is just changing, maybe, during centuries, on the image of God. Are we not shaping an idol of our own image, of our morality, our human ethics, imposing that on the revelation? Or is it our um, limited and changing human ethical notions applied to God? Um, it would be a victory of anthropology over against theology. Nevertheless, I think that the, this ethical principle, I would even call it ethical claim or restriction imposed on Elohim, has theological origins because Psalm 82 presents itself as a part of the divine inspired scriptures. So it is therefore God himself who argues that ethics is applicable also to the divine actions. Could therefore the ethics, as, uh, uh, as it can be recognized and perceived by a human being, be applied to judge a God? We may be shocked for the first thing, but actually if you read the Bible, I mean, it comes over and over and over again. It's not just a God after Holocaust studies, but we have an inspired book of Job in which God is taken to the court. Uh, what is more, the very same book gives us Job as the example to follow in his grudges against God and uh, condemns God's friends who spoke as God self-made uh, uh, advocates. They, are, they were wrong and Job was right. The same, the book of Job, Lamentations, Jeremiah, and a nar- number of Psalms they all have no hesitation whatsoever in charging Elohim or even Adonai, using the divine name, with what the human subject perceives as a moral fa- divine moral failure. Or it, he feels it like that, or some negligence from the part of the divinity. Of course, Job's moral judgment is not ultimate or unshaken, yet nevertheless, this ethical human judgment of God is presented in the scripture as both possible and I would even say necessary in our relationship with the living God. Um, If one looks closer, this ethical demand to which God himself submits himself is essential not only for the wisdom literature, I think it's really also true, for example, in Ten Commandments. Did Israel really need God to learn that it's bad to steal or to kill, to murder? All the nations around knew it and Israel didn't know they needed Moses to tell them? Actually, I think Decalogue is not just about some surprisingly new set of data, which otherwise would be not accessible to that people. Exodus 22 opens famous with the phrase, I am Adonai, your God. It is a self-presentation text. Here the Lord speaks about the actions he desires from his covenant people and at the same moment he reveals himself as a moral God. I am the God who wants to follow that rules. Well, also the prophets, more than just fighting against the cult of foreign gods, were waging war within the Yavistic religion. Let us know that very often the idol which was to be destroyed bore the name of the Lord. So this is 
that the calf in the desert of Bethel, of Samaria, they were all idols of the Lord, not of some other, of Baal or other divinities. So the prophets were struggling with the, I would call it, yes, the idol of immoral Adonai and the cult of that divinity which made the Lord literally sick, as we can read in passages of Isaiah. So what they desire, when they, uh, what God speaks to the prophets, they, he wants them to know me, to know who I am, not sacrifices, etc. And then we have all the list, of course, of, of ethical and moral um, behavior as a, as, a, as a criterion to that. Um, and maybe the last point, um, so this is an attitude that your reading inspires, which goes against fideistic and fundamentalistic positions, um, because fideism has nothing to do with abundance of faith, but I would rather say witnesses to its weakness. Um, so if the inspired scriptures witness and invite humans to enter into direct confrontation with the only living Elohim, how much more we are invited to do with a plethora of Elohim claiming their divinity in our own, our own heads, theological uh, reviews, uh, writings, popular culture, politics, wherever we are, there are different Elohims waving their flags that they are true. Um, I personally find consolation in Psalm 82 then, in its final statement, you will die like man and fall like on, uh, any one of the princes. Elohim of injustice, Elohim who show partial partiality to the wicked, Elohim who neglect the orphans, Elohim who justify the unjust, they will all die. Just let's sit and wait and pray to the true just God. And let's hope we'll participate in their funeral. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.